This is the sports song. The song that comes on before the sports. <laughs> this is the sports song. So sports are gonna happen soon. This is the sports song. And sports are a thing that we use to identify with an organization or a mentality. So that's interesting. It's like patriotism. Part of it's sports. <laughs> Hello and welcome. Whoa, both of us this time. Oh, God. All right. Hello and welcome to Nobody Asked. It's Yay. the show that nobody asked for with my mother, Maria. Hello, it's me. I'm sitting outside. She's outside and look at her two vehicles. Oh. One blue, one orange, and trees and greenhouse. <laughs> it says one thing. People have said about my mother, she's a woman of many hues. Yellow Indeed. chair, greenhouse, blue car, orange orange truck. Um, yes. Yeah, and, I like color. And then also it is me, Colin, a man of many hues on his sweatshirt. <laughs> Moby. Oh, it's him. He loves being on camera. He's a puppy of many colors. He looks very uncomfortable. <laughs> my light. Whoopsies. Uh, today on Nobody Asked, I'll, I'll tell you what subject nobody asked for. It's the Battle of Santiago. No. Wait, what? Wait, what's that? What, what's, what's the, the Battle man? of Santiago? Or what is, uh, yeah, the, is what, a, what is the Battle it, of Santiago? Is it a, a naval battle from 1898? Is it a FIFA battle from 1962? Yes. Or <laughs> is it the Canadian Latin Fusion Band? No, but that sounds interesting, and I wish I had Googled it. <laughs> I can't remove that comment because I logged on here after it appeared. Oh. Uh, today, we'll be talking about the Battle of Santiago. What was it? Uh, why has it fueled anti-Italian sentiments in Chile? Uh, or Chile. Uh, Chile. And Chile. Chile. Uh, and, and we will not be saying Italia in this, uh, in this show. They're Italy to me. <laughs> uh, uh, it, yes, the, the, what is the Battle of Santiago? What does it tell us about people and how sports are a medium through which we project our angers and fears and sentiments about other countries and other ways of being? Uh, yeah, but mostly <laughs> just it's an interesting story. That's like 90% of it. And then also, you know, there are some modern examples. Basically, people have been shitting on sports too much, okay? I hang, <laughs> out, I hang out with a ragtag crew of ultra intellectuals, and they act like sports ain't shit, okay? They act like sports are for the down and dirty morons of Mississippi and Alabama. And they are. But they're also for everybody. very interesting. <laughs> and, and they're fun. And, you know, there's something to project yourself onto and go Mets. So <laughs> that's the show. Um, all right. Well, uh, just to, to kick us off, uh, I've got a little bit of a video presentation for you. Oh, OK. I love a video presentation. Yes, we all do, Mother. We all do. All right. Are you, I'm still are you learning how to work fan? with two screen, screens. So oh, fancy. Share. Oh, 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 perfect. Oh, there it is. Hey, please. Coleman. Good evening. The game you're about to see is the most stupid, appalling, disgusting, and disgraceful exhibition of football possibly in the history of the game. Chile versus Italy. This is the first time the two countries have met. We hope it will be the last. The national motto of Chile reads, by reason or by force. Today, the Chileans were prepared to be reasonable. The Italians only use force. And the result was a disaster for the World Cup. Now, if the World Cup is going to survive in its present form, something's got to be done about teams that play like this. Indeed, after seeing the film tonight, you at home may well think that teams that play in this manner ought to be expelled immediately from the competition. Just see what you think. Yes, that's right, everybody. Today's episode is sponsored by the most British man you've ever seen. <laughs> My David God. Coleman. David Coleman. David Coleman. What a what a genuine sweetheart. Love that guy. Uh, and you know what else I like is as he is saying this, just uh, 
uh, such a passionate little monologue before the the showing of the uh, uh, of the match. Uh, what I like is that there's a very like Gen Z rack zoom onto him, like you know, in, in Gen Z, like in a TikTok, right? That uh, when people want to really emphasize a point, they'll really they'll zoom into their face and be like, "So what I'm saying is, right?" And this oh, is okay. this is like a format of uh, of emphasis in in TikToks and whatnot, and that's what this felt like. Was that it was like today there is a most deplorable showing of soccer, which the world will forever not be forgetting. And when we remember, we will think Italians are a bunch of bitches. So, <laughs> just, I uh, it is interesting that that was his takeaway personally. After what I watched, I was like. Was Chile ready ready to come with reason? Because it didn't seem like it to me. <laughs> no, it didn't. It didn't. It didn't seem like it did it. But then again, the Italians were being a bunch of dorks, and I don't know. It's 1962. Uh, the British and the Italian the Italians still not great friends. So you know, yeah. little little bit of stress from the old World War II. Uh, yeah, it, it was. It, it's an interesting presentation, and. Uh, we will end up showing some clips from the uh, from the game in this. Uh, important to emphasize, there's something about grainy black and white cameras that make violence look almost comical. Indeed. I mean, the frame rate must be off or something is wrong because the real life violence looks like a Charlie Chaplin film. They're like, Pah, come here, see? And <laughs> people falling down flat and you you can't tell what is and is not a flop. It's, it's no, exactly. It all looked like a bunch of flops, but then at the very same time, like one dude had a broken nose and stuff. So it clearly was more oh, than it was just a, flops. It was real. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that video that we just showed was uh, back in 1962. We didn't have too many satellites up in the air. So when they got a film of a World Cup game, it had to be uh, flown or sailed. It had to be flown. It had to be flown. Yeah. It, it had to be flown back to England so that it could be shown uh, in England. And so two days after the match, this got shown in England, which was enough time for there to be a presenter beforehand to be like, this was deplorable, unbelievable. Um, so, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting story. And that is what we'll be getting into today. Indeed. I, uh, you know, just, just full disclosure, I've been working for like two and a half days straight, uh, like working at night and in the morning and then i had meetings before this and i've got a meeting after this and so i feel like i'm talking really fast am i talking really fast <laughs> i feel like it's normal fast i don't, I don't mind it i don't mind it uh, i'm just like i'm just i'm bumped to a crisp baby so it's it's all it's all happening uh shall yeah. we start at the beginning or at the beginning yes uh in in 1942 and 1946, there was no World Cup because Whatever. we were fighting each other kind what? of a lot. Oh, the whole goodness. world just throwing hands just constantly. The Japanese, the Germans, the Americans, the English, the Italians, Indeed. really everyone. It was, uh, it was so many people were fighting in the war that they called it a world war. And this was the second time that it happened. So... World Cup gets canceled, and uh, organizations like this are not usually prepared for major world conflicts financially. So when the World Cup came back, it was already financially struggling. And in 1950, they held the first World Cup, and Germany and the Empire of Japan were both banned from the competition because Ooh. they had been big meanies. Uh, was the, those were the words that FIFA used. Um, so, uh, both of those teams were, uh, not allowed to compete, but, uh, entire countries were kind of letting out a sigh of post-war relief still in the years, in, in the years post-World War II. And so, uh, as the qualifying matches occurred, uh, countries were withdrawing entirely from contention. And so it was a pretty ragtag group that competed in the 1950 World Cup. Then... 1954, uh, West Germany and the Empire of Japan were allowed to qualify, and uh, from then on were allowed to qualify. 1954, 1958, 
and this year, 1962 in Chile, are considered by some scholars to be the three great slugfests of World Cup competition because countries still mad at each other, man. And the people that are competing fought in wars. I mean, I don't know if you've heard, but wars, it's all like 18 year olds, right? And then sports are like all 18 to 35 year olds. So these teams are playing each other and they were also like, you shot my brother, you know? And so it was hard to focus on put ball in net. And so yes. years of World Cup competition where it was just fists flying and uh, FIFA attempting to cook the books so that certain teams didn't face each other. Uh, the first World Cup that Germany was allowed back in, West Germany won the World Cup. and That caused all sorts of tension. And so it, it, beca it becomes, because of how much uh, time there is between e each World Cup, because there's four years in between each uh, World Cup, it, it becomes sort of like maybe this is how World Cups are, you know? Maybe, maybe this is just a boxing match with a ball in the middle, you know? No, uh, it's a dignified sport, very dignified. You know, I mean, yeah, <laughs> British, right? Um, if you ask the British. And so uh, generally, FIFA will uh, select a host for the World Cup around eight years before the World Cup needs to occur. Because there's a lot of infrastructure that's needed. A lot of people travel in for the World Cup. Uh, we just had a World Cup in uh, Qatar, which is a massive joke. Uh, and Qatar has like 50 people in it and they use slave labor to set up all of their infrastructure. And Ooh. guess what? This is just this is how FIFA works. <laughs> it's, it's like, it seems like every three years they're like, you know, something's going to go wrong with the host location. Well, Chile, uh, regularly a very competitive team in the World Cup, uh, passionate about soccer, was selected for the 1962 World Cup in, I believe, 1954. Is that, am I correct on that? Uh, I didn't think it was that many years before, but maybe it was. It, 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 was, it was more before. than two years before. It was more than two years. Which is important because is important. two years before uh, the World Cup occurred, the largest recorded earthquake in human history occurred in Chile, uh, which is, whoops. W whoops, yeah. I mean, say what you will about FIFA, but they cannot predict where earthquakes happen. No. And so while preparing for this World Cup, they're also repairing all of the infrastructure of Santiago and surrounding areas from the largest earthquake in recorded human history. Remember the earthquakes that have happened in your lifetime, which have killed in at some, wasn't there an earthquake that killed like a hundred thousand people in the last 20 years? The Haitian Gee. one. Oh, I, I, I've clearly blocked it out because sometimes that number of, of losing that many people in a natural disaster, I can't wrap my head, my head around it. See, I, I was, I, I was, I was but a boy. Uh, well, this, this oh. earthquake here said uh, the, the one in Vivaldi in, in Chile, there was like 50,000 people, 50,000 casualties. And then there was 2 million people in general that were affected by it. Um, uh, there were supposed to be eight different venues for the World Cup. And half oh of my them God. were too I damaged. Was right. <laughs> it was Haiti? It was Haiti in 2010. I. I thought, you know, you know, when you're a kid and just like things become bigger as time goes on, you're like that. That was the biggest thing that ever happened. Uh, casualties of the 2010 Haitian earthquake: 100 to 316 thousand deaths. Oh, what a range! Uh, the higher figure is from a government estimate, widely charged with being deliberately inflated. A figure of about 160 thousand is provided in a 2010 University of Michigan study. Uh, so yeah, Haiti, it's, it's got lot. corruption. Well, that was just a, that was an earthquake in the last, uh, that was a magnitude seven earthquake. The, uh, <laughs> the, yeah, the one in Vivaldi was 9.6. Oh my God. So, so yeah, so this was not, uh, a simple thing. I don't to... know why I keep saying Vivaldi. That's not how you say it. Valdivia. Valdivia. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Wait, did you say, did you say how many casualties there are? Yeah, there were 50,000 cas casualties, but 2 million people affected. Um, you know, originally there were eight cities that were selected to be the venues for these different matches as part of the World Cup. Mm -hmm. And, you know, half of them were too damaged to, to even continue. So we've now shrunk it down to just four locations. 
And, you know, that is definitely a big hit on the infrastructure to have all of those matches kind of isolated in a smaller area of the country (sighs) and chaos ensued. So, you know, like the world cup, you have like 56 teams that enter around 56 ish. Right. And then they, they get down to 16 qualifying teams that make it to the actual big world cup event in Chile. Um, Chile is automatically going to get in because they're hosting it. Um, the, the winner from the previous year, which was Brazil, is automatically in. And then whoever's won these different, you know, these different conferences, uh, you know, will will make it in there. So yeah, you ended up with 16 teams, and then they have 32 matches. So it's like four, four. It's like broken into four groups, and then those four compete with each other for different spots. And then you know the slots move on until you until you get to a winner. Yep. And this is this is largely the same as what the system is now as well, right? Uh, Qatar, for so. example, would essentially never qualify for a World Cup berth uh, normally. It's just that they were hosting. Um, yeah. It's it would be very rare for for a country like Qatar to to qualify. Um, Chile uh, qualifies uh, sometimes. I mean, it's not it's it's not never. Um, so. Uh, as this draws closer, there is just not enough time to create the infrastructure uh, and uh, for the World Cup and also the populations. I mean, the people are disenfranchised. The populations need to recover as well from this. I mean, thinking about Chile, it is not uh, as rich a country as modern day America. But what did New, New Orleans look like two years after Katrina? It looked like a fucking shit show. Okay. <laughs> there were definitely parts of it that looked totally fine. Other parts that were not fine at all. No. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the recovery from Katrina took a very long time in the richest country on the planet. So uh, a larger disaster in Chile, things were, things were very difficult. But uh, the competition was still hosted in Chile. And when people arrived, there was general unhappiness with kind of the state of the World Cup. But if, you know, it's kind of like me in an, among friends, right? My friends trust me to be the one that becomes a dick and starts complaining about things. <laughs> well, I am the Italians of our friend. <laughs> and whereas other people, the British, for example, might have gone, well, it's not, not what we expected, but the Chileans have shown great chutzpah and whatever in their, uh, you know, in, in recovery. Uh, the Italians... Uh, didn't give a fuck, especially the Italian journalists. Indeed, no, no. they did not. Indeed, were, they did not. There were two uh, Italian journalists, Antonio Girelli and Corrado Pizzinelli, which <laughs> sounds like <laughs> that, that sounds like someone wrote that. It sounds uh, like we made those names up, but they're real. <laughs> it really does. If you if you heard that name in like a, a musical that included a group of Italians, you'd be like, oh, you really reach for that. Like if J.K. Rowling wrote that name in one of her books, people would give her shit for it for sure. I like Cho Chang. Uh, so uh, they had written that Santiago was a backwater dump where quote the phones don't work, taxis are as rare as faithful husbands. A cable to Europe costs an arm and a leg, and a letter takes five days to turn up. And its population is prone to, quote, malnutrition, illiteracy, alcoholism, and poverty. Chile is a small, proud, and poor country. It has agreed to organize this World Cup in the same way as Mussolini agreed to send our Air Force to bomb London. In parentheses, they didn't arrive. (laughs) The capital city has 700 hotel beds. Entire neighborhoods are given over to open prostitution. This country and its people are proudly miserable and backwards, is what uh, journalists wrote about the host. Of Those the are what, yeah. Those are what the Italian journalists wrote, and that got back to the Chileans. The Chileans did not appreciate that kind of characterization of their country because they are a proud people even in their miserable backwards way. Listen, they are trying to recover from an earthquake. The government really did not care about, about the World Cup at this point. The, the government cared about, we, we've got infrastructure issues. I don't care about FIFA. I'm not putting more effort into making sure this FIFA thing works out. They did not care. And so it was just the people, the promoters in Chile that were trying to keep this together. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, uh, Chilean. Uh, this is Chilean newspapers fired back, describing Italians in general as fascists, mafiosos, oversexed, 
and because some of Inter Milan's players had recently been involved in a doping scandal, drug addicts, uh, oversexed. What does it? Yeah. Mean? What does that mean? <laughs> okay, so let's. Okay, do you remember when you were in the play, the drowsy chaperone, and they kept saying that you were an ethnically ambiguous. You were sort of an unknown ethnicity, yep. and you definitely played an oversexed character. I think perhaps in that in that regard, you were supposed to be Italian. <laughs> They were just playing on stereotypes. I don't know. I, I did not think that was the accent I was doing. No, no. <laughs> we, we were doing a very poor Hispanic accent. <laughs> was that what I was doing? What? <laughs> <Hey>, what? <laughs> Good times. It was pur purposely bad. Purposely bad. Once again, the video of my Jazzy Chaperone mm -hmm. appearance will be released on the Nobody Asked channel when we get to... 500 subscribers. <laughs> it's worth it. I'll have or, to find it. But... Uh, or, or if we get uh, 50 live viewers. Yeah. Ooh, we'll geez, that. that would be pretty impressive. Yep. That 50. I mean, we've gotten, gotten 25. So. <laughs> but also, if you guys just, you know, like in your local theater, if you get a chance to watch The Drowsy Chaperone, you just absolutely should. Oh you my absolutely God. should. It's so good. Yeah. And you'll see Adolfo, and then you'll imagine me playing Adolfo. And... <laughs> It'll be a good time. <laughs> oh man, I, I, I love that. I check uh, probably every six months to see if there is a audition for the Drowsy Chaperone near me. Uh, and there's always one on like Long Island, or I'd have to take a train an hour and a half. But one day, one day I'm going to get to uh, try out once again for it. Oh, apparently it was one thousand. Now it's five hundred. Any 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 number of significance. And we will release Colin's drowsy chaperone performance. <laughs> it was it, it was a thousand before, but you know, numbers become realistic over time, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, we're not doing a great job of trying to grow this. Really, we're just doing a good job of just doing what feels good. We're chilling, dude. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've got dedicated uh, fans like Barbie and Ashley, and uh, the others that are usually Susie B. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, needless to say, this rose tensions between the Chileans and the Italians. And importantly, now, you know, if you spoke to, to an old dying grand, Chilean grandfather in his bed and you asked him what he thought about Italians, there's a good chance that he's got some opinions about this game. Because decades of hatred of Italians from Chileans is informed from these events right here. It's a, it's one of my favorite things about history is like when you were super young and one of the two times that you talk to your great grandparents, you go and you speak to them and like you knew they were racist because they're from the past. You know, of course, they were going to be racist, but then they'd call out they'd call out some specific hatred where you're like, it's almost distracting how strange it would be, be like, well. At least you're not dating a goddamn Bolivian. And you're like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know you know where Bolivia is in the map. And he's like, I don't. <laughs> just hate him. So uh, this is this is that for Chile. This is the old people hate Italians because of this. And uh, those two journalists that wrote about Chile had to be, uh, they had to be taken out of uh, Chile. Chile. Uh, guarded. <laughs> Uh, what, what was the, the word that they used? Um, uh, they had to flee the country uh, and an Argentinian scribe mistaken for an Italian in a Santiago bar was beaten up and hospitalized. So tensions were flaring. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my grandma literally asked my Honduran husband at the dinner table on Easter how he felt about all the illegals crossing the border. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> You know, yikes, right? <laughs> yep. So that, something. There's something about the, these people that hold opinions that they know are like uh, not accepted, where they feel the need to like to put social pressure on you by saying it out loud and like forcing you to back your own opinions up. I, uh, one of my first girlfriends in Utah, um, she, we, we were dating and she had a, uh, a stepdad that she had described to me as racist. And uh, strangely, I had not, I, I just like 
I had not met real racism, or at least it hadn't been in front of my face uh, in a kind of unashamed way up to this point. So uh, I kind of like, I, I treated it like when, when a liberal tells you that a comedian is racist, you're kind of like, all right. So uh, then I met this stepdad and we were eating dinner and uh, he said, so Colin, uh, how do you feel that I would never let Lydia date a black guy? And I was like, uh, <laughs> I think that's bad. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> why, why are you doing this right now? Why, why people with these fucking garbage opinions feel the need to like. Put you on the spot about it, about their yeah, bad opinion. Yeah. The, it, I think that they get some sort of weird power joy from it. Just like, just like that. The fact that they know they're making you uncomfortable with their opinions that it just, uh, it gets them off in some sort of fucking way. And, uh, God, I fucking hate these people. <laughs> Not that we have any, you know, racist step family in our family. <laughs> Listen, it's, it's, it's almost impossible not to. And sometimes they don't recognize that they're, that they're racist, which is the weird part. And you're like, I think we were doing a pretty good job up until, you know, however many years ago. Yeah. Like a moderate yeah. job, I guess. Yeah, no, above average. We were doing above average for sure. Some extended family, I guess, that have some weird fucking opinions, but <laughs> like, like, but, oh, well. but, uh, but they're not way out. They're just like a little bit off the off the track, right? They're not like way. I mean, I don't know. But are we yeah, not, about on your side or on dad's side. Either yeah. before before the step parents were introduced. It didn't seem like like things were just way off the rails. They were just moderately off the rails. <laughs> yeah, they're just like eh, you know, that's an interesting thing to say. <laughs> then yeah. one of those, those step grandparents were like, "Whoa, yes. that's the real shit right there." <laughs> oh, oh, what oh, the, what the hot hell? <laughs> what what are, what's going on here? What are, what are you doing with this person? <laughs> I, didn't, I, I didn't know we still made them like this. I thought yes. I thought that these were all recalled. You oh, would boy. think. Nope. You would think. Oh, well. Um, so, uh, yeah, a British newspaper for the Daily Express wrote, uh, the tournament shows every sign of developing into a violent bloodbath. Reports read like battlefront dispatches. Italy versus Germany was described as wrestling and warfare. So Italy causing problems, which which may have uh, led to how specifically anti-Italy the uh, the British intro to the Battle of Santiago was. Right. Because, because so... Italy versus um, Chile, which is the Battle of Santiago. That's what we're going to talk about. Um, that was like the second game in, in the round. So Italy had previously, yes, they competed against West Germany. So they And they had already shown that they were willing to be giant jackholes. Giant <laughs> jackholes. Yep. <laughs> yep. And it was, yeah, it was very violent. Listen, soccer is a contact sport, but, you know, it's like, it's within reason. It's like, you know, your feet yeah, are touching It's not like hockey feet. or football. No, know? it's not that kind of contact. It's like, it's like basketball, you know? It's like, yeah. uh, try not to contact, but it'll happen, you know? Exactly. So what do you think? Do you want to, do you want to watch the clips from the Battle of Santiago first and then go over it briefly? Yeah, let, let's, let's show them and then we can discuss them. I mean, they're going to go pretty quick, probably. So we've got, I'm just going to, maybe I'll just give a brief, you know, before they go out on the field, you know, they're, they're like in the tunnel or whatever. And I don't know if they were lined up with each other, but apparently the Chileans were already worked up. They were already like spitting allegedly on the Italians. Everybody's getting mad at each other before they get on the field. And then, you know, in the beginning, it looked like Italy, they were doing like your more typical sort of soccer related foully type stuff where they're kicking each other or, you know, they're being a little bit more aggressive in their gameplay. And then it appeared to me that Chile, as soon as you did that, it was like the gloves are off. <laughs> yep. so, so let's the, the white shorts. Uh, again, I don't know how they did this in the past, right? Like how do they watch these games when they look almost, uh, you know, uh, almost identical uniforms. Uh, Susie B says, I'm from NYC, so guess I was lucky. No Archie Bunkers. NYC, baby. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ooh. What part of NYC? Long Island has the crazies. They got the crazies on Long Island. Maybe Staten Island also. Um, so, yeah, uh, white shorts is Italy. White shorts is Italy. Black shorts is Chile. Let's go. Chile.
Now watch the pile of people. And well, okay. There's trouble oh, okay. already. There's a fight going on in the middle there. Well, this looks like turning into a real battle. There's two Chileans down the field. And what a scene after just five minutes play. <laughs> just just, just kick him. Well, this is absolutely ridiculous. We really should have been overkicked a player who's no idea at all. And he's off the field. He's been set right off. And the police are being called on, or the army, the police are back. This is the police. Yep, the, the, the player refused to get off the field, so the police had to be called on. I've ever seen anywhere in the world. This is a good one. Oh, oh. Oh! That was one of the neatest. I'm sorry. Why do punches look like they are nothing in this kind of film? It doesn't even look like he winds up. Kick, 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 and then just like a little tap, and then he's just. That was one of the neatest left hooks I've ever seen. It's it's funny. David is absolutely out cold. Look at him. He's he's he's. Here we go again. Oh, oh kick, a kick to the shoulder slash face area. Flying kick through the air. That just bought it right in the face. That was David, and he's off the field. Well, Italy down to nine men. Well, that was one of the most cold blooded and lethal tackles I've ever seen. Tentus, remember, was the man who was swinging David a few minutes ago. You want me to pause? Yeah, that guy. So, those were the same two people that we saw on the other end of the field. The, the one that's doing the kicking this time was the one that got punched in the face on the other end of the field. <laughs> and the one that got punched is now the one on the ground. So, okay. well, David's got ample revenge in the worst possible way. And so we go now into the second half of what is sure to be known as the Battle of Santiago. Navarro. Maravillas. And the stadium's erupted. Every man in the crowd on his feet. Tamperas, Laura. Oh, we got to get Robbie back out of the fight. Everything going in there. Well, how can Aston possibly keep this game going? What the hell do you think? Oh, that's a great goal. Oh, the humiliation of the Italians is now complete. Just the ball about. Come on, get the ball. Let's just start fighting. <laughs> Here's the ref. I think the game is over. Can't on his way to the dressing room. Oh, gunfight. <laughs> uh, so interestingly, Ken Aston. Uh, this was his, his last game uh, refereeing in the World Cup. Um, and, uh, no, you know, not because he did a bad job. I think he, he was quite frustrated in it. And uh, Ken Aston later went on to invent the yellow and red card system for, mm -hmm. uh, for soccer, which is still employed today. So the Battle of Santiago, it didn't just make Chileans hate Italians. It also <laughs> created rules. <laughs> Right. Well, we did see he kicked off. So he kicked off two um, Italian players during the course of those videos, during during the course of the fighting. Now, did he did he kick out any Chileans? No. The guy that punched the other dude in the face, he punched another. He punched him in the, somebody else in the face who and broke his nose later on as well. He punched two different people in the face and never was removed from the game. You know, the referee, Ken Aston, he's like, man, I, I just didn't see it. And I did not have great help. Apparently, so this is what he said. So there was like two other... Um, line reps, right? Yep. One of them was he got there because his name is Leo Goldstein, and he got there because he had a great story. He was a Holocaust survivor, and how he how he survived the Holocaust was he he was about to be, I don't know, possibly taken to the gas chamber. The way the story goes, and one of the guards is like, "Hey, does anybody know how to ref soccer? Does anybody know how?" And he just immediately volunteered himself. And he did well enough that he managed to survive, you know, the concentration camps by refing 
games, I'm assuming between guards, <laughs> but it could have been, they could have been forcing people to play. Who the heck knows? And so that was his story. Um, and that, that got him an automatic, you know, spot at the World Cup refereeing. And then a bit, <laughs> so this is what he said. He said, I was stuck with a Mexican and a little American because because that Goldstein ended up emigrating to America. A Mexican and a little American. They weren't very good. So it became me against 22 players. <laughs> It just feels like such an inappropriate thing to say. <laughs> That's just that, you know, when people are like, oh, they're from a different time. I feel like this is what they mean is like yeah. whenever they talk about people, they're like, well, it's a Mexican, it's Italian. You're Chileans. They're backwaddy, dirty, <laughs> it's, open it's, prostituting, it's, miserable, you know? Well, okay. But even before that, so even how Ken Aston, Ken Aston made it to this game because he's a British referee, um, initially it was supposed to be a referee from Spain and Italy threw a fit about that. Again, probably leftover tensions from the war, but you know, Italy complained, well, they, uh, what did they call it? It was a great word. The Spanish rep is a, is a his, Hispanophones. So, <laughs> which apparently they share the same language, but what a weird way to say it, Hispanophones. And so because they share the same language, he's automatically the referees are automatically going to be, you know, fa they're going to favor Chile. And so they threw the UK one in. But again, Italians and, UK and, and the British don't love each other right now either. So they weren't particularly happy with this ref being there either. But they yep. sort of ran out of, out of things they could complain about. <laughs> Man, it, it's, it's just crazy to think about all this. And uh, I think the, the overarching idea here. Uh, is just that it is interesting to look at uh, history and international relations through the lens of sports. And it, it can happen in, in two directions, right? Uh, here, in one direction, there are these multinational competitions which occur in the real world and in a space where international relations are constantly changing, right? So the Olympics and the World Cup occur and are cared about by millions and millions of people um, and include warring countries and countries with vastly different uh, cultures. Uh, for example, in this most recent World Cup, uh, in the group stage, America and Iran were in the same uh, group. And uh, just yesterday, Iran started putting out uh, rhetoric about how uh, any drone strike in Iran would be an act of war by America, right? There are strong war tensions between America and Iran at this moment. And during the World Cup, the hijab protests that uh, we spoke about uh, in an earlier podcast were uh, in their height. And there's this, uh, this other the inseparable bond between media and athletes. And so uh, the media covered the politics of what was happening in, in Iran and the Iranian uh, soccer players had to decide whether or not they represented the revolution in Iran or they represented the government, which was oppressing women in Iran. Uh, this was not necessarily the reason that they wanted to play soccer, these Iranians, right? They probably <laughs> like, wanted to play. I like soccer. <laughs> yeah, they probably wanted to play because it's fun, because they can make money and, you know, they can represent the place that they're from. But it just so happened that it overlapped with a cultural moment. And uh, the good news is that the, uh, the Iranians, uh, they, they protested alongside the uh, protesters of the hijab. Um, they did, you know, they took the, the right side of things in this. And for all their trouble, while they were representing Iran and the Iranian government, the government threatened to kill the families of the soccer players, right? So sports, uh, you know, for all that they're called kind of, you know, dumb drivel and for all the time that they kind of are, uh, they are a, an interesting lens for uh, humans and groups and cultures. And they end up being uh, a totem onto which we, we project our, our different uh, countries and cultures. Uh, Absolutely. It, it can happen in the other direction as well. Sorry that I'm just like going on and on here. But no, no, um, no. Uh, another thing that what we're talking about there is how how it embodies conflicts between countries. Uh, it can also embody that uh, 
uh, repairing relations between countries. Uh, famously, in Russia, in the uh, in the late '80s, before the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, there was a strong uh, among government officials. There was strong concern that in uh, poor and middle class uh, groups in Russia, and even soldiers in Russia, and uh, and and uh, and government representatives, there was a frenzy for baseball. Russians. Oh loved baseball, a quintessentially American sport. And there was concern among uh, Russian uh, government officials that this spelled the doom of the Soviet Union because, uh, it, it, because people were going to be more exposed to American ideals because the best baseball players of the time were in America playing in, uh, in MLB. Uh, but also it would lead to interfacing between uh, Russian athletes and American athletes if more of them played baseball. Um, as relations post-World War II between Japan and America repaired, they became uh, very interested in baseball. Uh, as uh, America attempts to uh, bring closer European uh, the, Europe to its, uh, to its interests as it, you know, the, there's some debate over whether or not America can maintain its global superpower status in terms of uh, economics, we see increased investments in our soccer program and uh, an increased interest in, in soccer generally. All of these uh, ebbs and flows of sports uh, are, are intertwined with politics and culture and news. Uh, and it, it can be an interesting lens to see the effect of those on individuals and on, uh, and on cultures. So I no, think it's it, very interesting. It is. It is really interesting. Like, I, I think it is important to understand. I don't know. Like, I don't if you've ever watched the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders TV show, right? They, yep. they want them to know about events. They don't want them to be just cute faces. They want them to be able to interact with the public and they want them to be able to understand what's going on in the world, at least on some small level. Right. Um, because you do turn into an ambassador for, your country or your state or your city. I mean, it just depends on how big you go. And, you know, I think we've lived in other countries, so we understand how important it is to represent your country well and to not be, be a spectacle. You know, you don't walk around covered in a giant American flag everywhere you go and swearing and carrying on and, and doing things that you would do here. Just <laughs> it wouldn't be a big deal. But yeah. you don't go. You don't go to other countries and make a spectacle of yourself because you are representing something. And it is interesting what you're talking about. You know the fear of the west of Westernization through something like sports, right? It is a great um, media or medium for yeah connecting, connecting to a little bit of America. And it's such a. It seems benign at first, but you can see the idea that Russia would be scared of something that feels benign to us. It's just baseball, man. It's just a yep. good time. It's just peanuts and cracker jacks, <laughs> right? Well, you, what's the problem here? Yep. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's interesting. It is. Well, I'm right now. Uh, you know, speaking of of international competition, there is a debate going on uh, in the Olympic Committee concerning the Summer Olympics. Uh, Russia, obviously, is still heavily involved in a uh, war in Ukraine and uh, committing all sorts of fun little war crimes and uh, you know, using what? private militaries, which are committing all sorts of atrocities across Eastern Ukraine, uh, even against Russian citizens. Um, and uh, all of this is occurring in, and people from outside of the location are able to be closer to it and see the atrocities as they happen because of the prevalence of smartphones. And it's put a lot of pressure on the Olympic Committee to determine, it's already been determined that Russia, the, the, the Russian Federation will not be allowed to uh, compete in the Summer Olympics in 2024. Uh, that they're, they're banned from, from the Summer Olympics. Uh, it has not been determined whether or not Russian athletes will be allowed to compete under an individual banner or an independent athlete banner. Because historically, we've done that with uh, with serious conflicts and war crimes. Yeah. And what's happened is they've shown up and they've gone for Russia or whatever, and say you know that they've come and they've they've clearly represented 
the country and and undermined the uh you know the power of the olympic committee and right. this is another question is like how much animosity will there be uh against russian athletes uh, surely when ukraine comes out you know in that olympic ceremony where they all walk around the the quarter mile track together certainly the crowd is going to be loud as hell during that actually is the summer olympics in china Shoot, I'm not on top of things. I don't know. Uh, we'll let you Google Olympics it. 2024. Uh, Man, China's done the Olympics. Oh, a lot. Paris, Paris, Ooh, Paris, Paris. Um, in the summer, okay. man, Paris is hot in the summer. So a hundred percent, like that. When Ukraine comes out, it's going to be loud as hell, right? But mm -hmm. What, what will tensions be like, you know, if Russian athletes are allowed to compete, right? How, how important will that be? I mean, for different players, what, how demoralizing will it be when a Ukrainian athlete falls to, a, to an independent athlete from Russia? How incredible will it be when a Ukrainian athlete succeeds against them, right? I mean, that the entirety of the world is going to be rooting against these athletes. It's, it's incredible. We saw in F1, uh, one of the uh, uh, not Nikita Mazepin um, was a, a Russian F1 driver for an American F1 team. So and, Formula One, that's what F1 is, Formula, Formula One. One. Yeah, yeah. And the war began, I believe, like four weeks before the F1 season began. Oh. And one week before the season began, they kicked him off the team, the American uh, team, because his father was an oligarch. <laughs> uh, oh, it turns out to be a race car driver, you have to be kind of for money. Um, Makes sense. All of these stories and how they work together is, is one of the reasons that I love sports. I love sports on an individual level. I love the story of, uh, you know, of individuals trying to become part of, uh, of greater things, of, of individuals overcoming uh, hurdles, the story of the individual. But I also enjoy how they represent locations, right, within the context of uh, the U.S. and U.S. sports. I love the Utah Jazz. I love that it's one of the weirdest uh, team name and location combination <laughs> in all of sports. Um, I it, it is the only professional team for uh, big. Uh, they have soccer, but soccer is kind of like pseudo professional in the U.S. Uh, it is the the only full professional team in Utah, and it is embraced super strongly by the region for that reason. People are incredibly passionate about the Utah Jazz, right? Here in New York, we've got the Yankees and we've got the Mets and choosing which one you root for is like choosing what side of New York you want to be on, right? What oh. kind of New Yorker, what, what element of it are you here for, right? Are you here because you, you love the fucking grind mentality of New York? Or are you here because you love that it's the greatest city on earth in the in the first place, right? I would say Mets, Yankees for those two arguments. Uh, I just like sports, man. <laughs> and I love the Mets, baby. Go Mets. Um, yeah. I don't know. It's just cool. It is cool. You know, and, and, and we've watched other times where sort of cultural and political things have spilled out into sports. I mean, it happens all the time. And it's almost, again, we, the, you can blame the media as well because they ask those questions, right? You don't just say, how was your game? You start asking them harder and harder questions. You know, hey, this incident happened in your, in your city. What do you have to say about that? You know, and it, it instantly starts turning political. We can look at Colin Kaepernick very obviously. Absolutely. And we can see all of the po political and cultural things that happened around that. And how, look at the lens of time might change how adamantly some people felt about it. You know, some people really went in way too hard on the wrong side of that. And I would hope that by now people would realize. Man. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's I, I mean, it's the the tenor of it has completely changed. But one of the things that was interesting is that it was uh, a peak for, you know, uh, northern and, and democratic fans of sports. It was a peek into just how set in their ways many football fans were. Uh, you know, football has always been affiliated with a certain sort of Southern mentality type of thing. It's, it's a very Republican sport type of vibe to it. But, 
you know, you, you can be a Jets fan and still love, or a or Patriots fan and still love uh, football, right? And uh, and you can be in a sort of denial about how the rest of the country looks at football or how the general football fan looks. And that was a mirror turned on the, the NFL and its fans in general in the fact that the target audience of NFL games was not America in general. It was a subsection of America that many of us find undesirable. <laughs> and you're like, oh, Jesus. The progress has not been made over here. I mean, listen, I, I feel like I feel like progress has been made. I I, I feel like we're moving. The same amount like, of progress, I guess, is what I'm saying. Uh, it sometimes feels like we're moving lightning, lightning fast in the last several decades. And for some people, it's just too fast, man. They cannot digest the speed of the world and the speed with which change is happening. And I just want to give people a little bit of grace with that. Like, it's one thing if you are like, I don't want to know. I don't want to learn new things. Um, this inconveniences me and I don't want to, I don't want to change. But if you're like, if you're legitimately like, I don't understand this, you know, this is not the way it was before. And something has changed that I don't understand, but I would like to understand. Like, man, I'm open to that. If you don't understand and you want to understand, yeah, I can appreciate that. But if you just are bothered by being inconvenienced by the fact that the world has changed, <laughs> yep. man, we can't, we can't slow down progress. We just can't. There is no going back in any positive way. You can't. The only way to go backwards is for something fucking terrible to happen. So you got to keep moving forward and, you know, just look beyond yourself every once in a while. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry. I don't know why I just went on that side tangent. <laughs> anyway, so sports. Like <laughs> <laughs> Battle of Santiago. Uh, it, 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 is, it is crazy to look back. Well, I, for me, it feels year to year like so little changes uh, in some ways. And, and the things that do change, you're kind of like, God, but it's still so human, you know? It's still so like, yes, even when there's positive progress, it feels like it's coming from a negative human place. Like it's, it's coming from the same fucking chakra that hate came from in another area. It's just being used for a good thing now, but it can be pushed yeah. past its limit. Absolutely. Uh, but then when you look Absolutely. back through time, you're like, well, things have changed pretty, pretty fast, you know? Uh Yeah. There's some, there's some things where you're like where you're kind of surprised how how much they are the same, uh, you know, and then there are other regions where it's just so different, um, you know, what was what was even conceivable to say, uh, yeah. Not sure what's going on out here. What a weird sound. I can't hear. You. <laughs> oh, good. Plane? No. Maybe somebody trying to start an engine of, uh, you know, like a, with a pull cord, but a really loud one. I don't know. <laughs> I don't understand what I'm listening to. Uh, okay. Battle of Santiago. <laughs> Battle of Santiago. No, it's just interesting. Yeah. Battle of Santiago is interesting. One, because just the fighting is, is, is always, listen, we're humans. We do enjoy a little bit of, a little yep. bit of, a little bit of violence, but the idea that it was spurred on so much by the media having opinions that they thought they should express very loudly <laughs> and they have then riled up the masses. It's interesting. We see that stuff happen. We see it happen. And I do think journalists do have a responsibility to think about the results of what they're writing down. You know, is this true? Is it helpful? You know, what are you, what are you doing, bro? <laughs> you know. Yep. Well, that's an interesting, you know, that there's an interesting podcast right there is just like how should journalists think about the content that they put out there? Um, because, uh, you know, on one hand, it's considered a journalistic faux pas to pay too much attention to the impact that your writing can have. Right. Oh. And it leads to a number of different, uh, you know, the decisions which undermine the trustworthiness of media. I'm thinking here of like, uh, you know, Hunter Biden laptop type nonsense where when it is shown and when there are emails that indicate something to the effect of, well, 
we can't verify that this is true in the timeline that we have. That's true, right? And also, it stands to significantly undermine an incredibly important election. And so we should decide to uh, ignore or wait to report on this. This is a struggle for truth and media is like, what, when do you have to, uh, to share the truth because you're supposed to be a truth sharing organization? And when do you have to choose to uh, omit certain things because of the negative impacts that they might have, you know. Ugh. Wasn't there some 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 Hillary Clinton story that came out like a month before uh, the election? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that that was the the Justice Department. You know, was investigating her emails because she wasn't using secure servers. And that, that was way before, though, right? The emails were way before. No, no. the The release of the findings was. Oh, was, oh okay. Yeah, it was right then. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it wasn't her. I don't believe her email was hacked. I believe it was somebody, one of somebody else had a server at their home that had email correspondence between her. You know, they were part of the State Department and theirs got hacked. <laughs> but also her security measures were garbage. So it was just luck that hers didn't get hacked, really. But yeah, no, it was about that. It was the Justice Department or the FBI, whoever it was, releasing the information that they had found. And it was that. The answer was that yes, she was not doing a good job of of, of securing information. You know, yeah. it was bad. It, and yeah, I, that's the way I remember that going down. <laughs> there was probably another element that I can't remember. Yeah, well, that, that could be an interesting podcast. It's just like journalistic ethics. Yeah, but. I must prepare for a meeting. Indeed. Indeed. That's why we went early today because Colin had a meeting because he's working his fanny off this week. Yup. I'm being acquired. You're being acquired. Oh, so the decision's been made. You're being acquired. Uh, I mean, it's, it, you know, it, it's like uh, it's like when, when, when somebody says a decision's been made, but they're like, but a lawyer's still working out the details. Like the numbers aren't aren't exactly where they are, but we are both operating in good faith to each other that the decision will be made and an agreement will be come to. Uh, and so there's, there's mutual concessions that have been made in the interim period, mm. um, but they need to change their, uh, their tax classification in order to acquire me. So uh, oh. that's going to take like a month or two. Uh, but before that, I'm still making more money. So <laughs> sitting at home, being acquired, doing yep. what you do. Being acquired, good stuff. Remember when I got fired during this podcast, and then I yeah. started grant writing, and then what I a side hustle, did, yeah, what I did with my side hustle was enough to get acquired. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, you know when I got fired, uh, they I've I've said it many times before, but they they said that they wanted to transition to a commission only model. Uh, and they said in that original email that it would include an increase in commissions. And so I emailed them, okay, what is the increase in commissions? And they acted like I had said something offensive by just asking for specifics on how I'd be paid, right? And How dare you? They were, they were freaking out about loyalty and whatnot and essentially saying that they had shown a lot of uh, – they had taken a risk on me and they had shown a lot of loyalty to me. And that they were that that I would be expected to make concessions, and Some I said something. To the, I said something to the effect of, you know, it's funny to hear you say that because I don't think that you know that I'm making a concession in the state before you said you'd stop paying me. Right? You're paying me under what I can get other places, uh, and they said they were disappointed that I would threaten them when I said <laughs> that I was threatening to get another job, and. Uh, what what my boss said was, well, you know what? If you can get paid better somewhere else, then go do it. And guess what, Tom? I fucking did. Okay. <laughs> and I'm about to get paid almost two and a half times more than you were fucking paying me. So if you'd like, I can send you my dick. Oh. You can suck it. Fuck you, Tom. <laughs> you, fucking clown. I mean, you, you probably shouldn't send that just generally. <laughs> Fine. 
<laughs> Just uh, um. Oh, yeah. If you can make more money elsewhere, then go do it. Yeah, dude. Okay. I worked for you because you were a fucking TV show and I wanted to work in TV. And guess what? I did. I worked in TV. And also, you suck. You can't raise money and you don't know how to raise, run a fucking business. And you don't know how much grant writers are worth. And I took less money for the opportunity and you acted like you were taking a fucking chance on me. Okay. Guess what, bro? You don't pay under market value for somebody from the best college in the country. God. <laughs> <laughs> and then say that, they, that you're taking a chance on them. No, you don't. Okay. Yeah. Fuck you were taking you. a, you were taking a pretty, uh, you know, low, low effort risk is what he was taking. He's like, this, this is probably going to work out. This guy yeah. clearly can make it through a very he's rigorous taking a risk on his company can't raise grant money. Okay. So here's what he's taking a risk on is like the fact that I didn't have experience with corporate funding and his company can't raise grant money. And I went, yeah, let's try together. And he's like, you know, and if it doesn't work out, we'll put you, we'll put you somewhere else. And then I got God, you know what I fucking did is I got him grant money. You know what I fucking did is I got it. I got the biggest organization that can fund this sort of thing on a phone call. Colin's reliving a fucking moment here. And, <laughs> uh, I got them on a phone call and I got them interested and I got them hitting big ass fucking numbers. Okay. I don't know what I'm allowed to say numbers wise, but let's say big ass. Okay. <laughs> big ass numbers they're saying on there. And what does one of them say to me? They say, Hey, just so you know, we're getting to a really good place with this application here. But just so you know, once this is approved, there's a due diligence period where you're going to need to open up your books to us. And it's just basic stuff like, are you guys financially stable? Are you guys going to be able to survive without our grant funding? And I said, oh, Ooh. yeah, that shouldn't be a problem. And then I got off that call and I went, Yee! And, <laughs> and I called Tom on a Friday, this fucking prick. And I called him on a Friday, on a Friday and I said, hey, just so you know, we're in a really good place with this. There's a due diligence period. And they essentially just need to know that there's a level of financial stability at the company because they can't agree to give a bunch of government money to an organization that won't exist by the time it gets the money. And uh, Tom got really mad on that phone call because he said I was accusing him of being financially unstable, right? And he, and uh -oh. he, gets, and he starts saying... Guess what? You know, we will be financially unstable if you can't raise any money for us, Colin. And I'm like, all right, let's take a step back here. I am currently raising money for you. And the whole idea of grants is that you need money, that we, you need some degree of financial stability to get money. And he's like, well, the, you're, you're applying for this big ass grant and you should be applying for smaller ones. And I was like, that confuses me because you're saying you don't have money. And to me, what I'm hearing is you want more money. And if you want me spending all my time on small grants, you're not going to be able to pay my paycheck. So that's Friday, right? And I don't say things like that. I say I'm real nice. I say I'm real cute. And and we're like, well, let's figure out a plan here. But we're in a good place with this big old, big old fucking grant. And then on Monday, hey, guys, good news. We're not paying you anymore. We're paying you commission only. We're moving to a commission only structure. We believe this will incentivize you to close sales more often because that's that's why we weren't closing them not because your business sucks no it's because we don't want to we don't our commission's <laughs> not big enough you fucking clown and so well yeah let's but we're going to a commission only structure but don't worry you'll see more commission to incentivize you to finish sales okay tom what's the more commission well colin fuck you for asking also it wouldn't apply to the big grant you're getting us <laughs> What? Oh, oh, you don't want it to apply to the thing that I got? You fucking idiot. You want me to keep working on it for no pay and not get the higher commission? Uh, my boy, have you heard of cake? Because you're trying to have it and eat it too. You're putting the cart before the horse. You're fucking beating a dead horse. You're doing all the different things people say. You <laughs> idiot, dude. Oh, well, and you know, I took a risk on you, Tom. Oh, well, if you can make more money elsewhere then go do it. I did, bitch. Okay? <laughs> uh, 
Thank you for that, Colin. Uh, Susie B says, coffee's for closers. <laughs> Coffee for closers. Yo. <laughs> Fuck that shit, okay? I, God. Why can't I bottle these things and get them on stage? Because when I'm on stage, I'm like, I'm trying to, because I feel like my persona has to be angry, you know? Because it's when I'm my funniest. And, uh, but no, I can't do it. And so what persona have I been going on stage with lately? It's the persona from my SNL audition. You remember that, mom? Wait, is this the person that thinks he's fat? But what? wait, I don't wait. What's your SNL audition? Uh, here, let me go into it. Uh, let me let me go into the persona. Everybody, watch Colin change personas. Hey guys, um, today I will be doing an SNL audition. That was him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, that's not what you should go on stage with. What is oh, that? Uh, I've been killing. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, Wait, uh, can, I, can I show you the SNL audition? It's so funny. Wait, you've actually you actually have uh, recorded an SNL audition? You've definitely seen this, Mom. It was a, it was just a joke. I could have sworn that I, I heard you you. There was one day on the porch where you were sort of spitballing an idea. I don't remember seeing a recording. You don't remember seeing a recording? Well, get ready to see it. it <laughs> I fucking love this video. This is one of the most. The most. <laughs> I fucking love this. Video. Did you record it on the porch? Yep, I did. Yeah. Oh, okay. So maybe I, I was there then. Hey guys, this is my audition for Saturday Night Live. So let me start with some impressions. This is my impression of. Donald Trump. Hey, don't do that. It's good. All right. Now that the funnies are all out of the way, uh, let me tell you why I think I would be an excellent cast member. I am always a friendly and welcoming personality in the office. And on Fridays, I sometimes bring in baked goods. Uh, <laughs> When I write emails, they are with correct punctuation and formal introductions and conclusions. There will never be a problem with clarity when I send you a formal email. I'm a really big fan of Andy Samberg, so I think that we would get along. Some, some things, yeah. <laughs> I, um, my worst attributes are I am afraid of bees. Back to the impressions. Uh, this is my impression of a weed dealer, okay? Hey man, <laughs> you like to purchase some marijuana. I have some on me and it is for a price that both of us would be amicable to. Just kidding. I am a policeman. <laughs> yep. I currently that was dad. Parents. That was dad walking in on me filming this. Final, <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry. Wait, wait. Yep. Dad What's walks that? in. Yep. <laughs> I currently live with my parents for my final uh, impression. This one might be a little spicy. So, you know, it could be on the cutting room floor, just like all of Kyle's bits. <clears throat> this is going to be an impression of uh, Cosby. I am in jail. So that is a okay. goofy guy, but I will note that that is my strength. All right, thank you, Lauren. Um, I uh, look forward to hearing from you thank you <laughs> that was ridiculous <laughs> i mean it's one of the best pieces of content i've made in my life <laughs> i am in jail <laughs> oh man holy shit <laughs> i love that video so much uh so that's what i've been going on stage as 
Oh man, it's good. But it's been working for some reason. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess I've, I've only done it once. But uh, the yeah, I've been thinking about because because Ellie's in Vancouver, and so I've been thinking about oh. taking the dog on stage. Uh, and I, I can't decide if I want all of it to be about why I need the dog to be around all the time, or if I want to never acknowledge that I have a dog with me. Hmm. I don't know which is funnier. I guess I, you'd ha I'd have to hear both bits and then I would know. And I'm sure it would vary by audience. Yep. Well, I was going to do. Uh... I mean, you got to get going, though. Oh, yeah. Well, I got I, I have 19 minutes, but yes. Do some prep for the call. Yeah. All good. All right. Norm, Norm McDonald esque says Ashley. That's that is a that's a big compliment for high praise. High praise. <laughs> high praise. I do love me some Norm McDonald. Glad we got we, we got some good laughs and 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 dead emojis from the crowd. This is pretty good. <laughs> you need to recreate that exact video. I, I created in, it. In front of the audience, I think. You just need to go in front of the audience and do that. Oh, in front of the... This is why... Hey, guys, I just want to practice my SNL audition. <sighs> There's something about the, the cuts in that video that mm -hmm. are so good, too, because some of them are youtube -y and clearly me trying to be on different sides of the frame, but then the framing is so bad in multiple parts. And sometimes it would just include me walking to the other side of the frame. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's what was funny. That was definitely part of what was funny. And then suddenly you were up close and you're like, What's going hello. On? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It would be funny. I, it's I, I funny because you, you actually do do a very good uh, Donald Trump impression. So the fact that that was your Donald Trump impression. <laughs> Don't do that. It's bad. <laughs> you know, uh, the other thing that I remember about that is that I had just, when we were spitballing about it, uh, it was just trying to come up with videos and, and we were talking about an SNL audition and I came up with that character while we were on the porch mm -hmm. and started, uh, started just improvising things that character would find funny. And, and then it was just like, I filmed it 15 minutes later. And even in that video, I was improvising. Like, I don't think that the Bill Cosby impression, I, it was me up there being like, all right, what's the next thing this guy's going to say? And I said <laughs> Bill Cosby. And I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> and, then, and every single time, I just have to, <laughs> I just have to go up and be like, what's my brain going to say? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> I am in jail. I mean, one of the best punchlines. <laughs> that was, it was a good punchline. Oh, good times. Okay. Well, thank you guys for watching that with me and listening yes. to me rant at Tom. Yes, that too. And also, you know, us talk about a weird soccer match in sports in general. Yep. Battle of Santiago. See, si, see, si, see, si, see, si, see. Si. Okay. Well, thank you all. Uh, should we say hello to, or goodbye to everybody? I don't yes, know. You, you do that while I pull up the music. Oh, what, are you want me to say goodbye to people? Yeah. Or thank you, thank you for watching. Thank you, Ashley, Barbie, Susie B. And then I can't scroll very well. Da, 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 da. Ooh, Patricia C. Uh, 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 uh. I know I saw somebody else in here. Somebody else was in here earlier. Oh, Venus de Militant, which is a fun de name. Militant. De Militant. Uh, thank you guys all for coming and watching us live. And you know. If you're watching on replay, feel free to leave us a comment. I yeah, probably boy. will acknowledge it. <laughs> yeah, boy. We love all of you and hugs and kisses and goodbye. Sports, sports, sports. Sports. Throw the ball. <laughs> yeah. Catch it. Ooh, catch it. Then put it in the net. Motherfucker, put it in the net. In the net. Put that ball in a net. And then you get some points. One, or two, or three, or seven. Or six. That one is a weird sport. Yeah, yeah. Um.